Analyzing the Use of Sources in Model Papers and Essays. Our speaker is Dr. Jim McDonald, Professor of English and Head of the Department of English at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, where he's taught for 25 years. Jim received a PhD in English from the University of Texas at Austin with a concentration in rhetoric. He is the author of the Pearson Composition textbook, The Reader, as well as editor of the Allen & Bacon Sourcebook for College Writing Teachers, and he's the co-editor of Mardi Gras, Gumbo, and Zydeco, Readings in Louisiana Culture. He's published a number of articles on composition and rhetoric, often focusing on writing centers and labor issues in composition, in journals such as College English, the Writing Center Journal, WPA, the Writing Lab Newsletter, English Journal, Kairos, and the Journal of College Writing, as well as in several book collections. His presentation will illustrate source analysis with both an academic paper and a popular publication, and discuss the ways in which sources are used outside of academic writing, for example, in popular genres where they support and enliven claims, as well as provide opposing arguments. And his aim is to demonstrate that the need for documentation is not confined to research papers, but is a responsibility of most writers, regardless of genre. Jim, are you ready to get started? Jim, I know you're there. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me now? Hi, Jim. We got gotcha. you. Hi. All right. Uh, what you're looking at right now is um, uh, part of the website for the citation project. I thought that would uh, uh, point that out, that uh, project out to you. Um, it's run by um, it's a it's a long-running um, research project uh, out of the University of Syracuse under uh, uh, Professor Rebecca Moore Howard and, and others. Uh, that really look that is looking at how students in uh, are actually using their sources, it, citing them, quote, quoting them, plagiarizing them, uh, uh, and and uh, and the findings published so far are pretty disturbing. Right? Um, uh, there's little sign of um, of that students are evaluating their sources. There's a lot of uh, what uh, a, a Professor Howard calls patch writing, which she prefers to to plagiarism, really botched paraphrasing that does not um, uh, that, that doesn't come from a desire to uh, uh, to cheat, uh, uh, doesn't come from academic dishonesty. Uh, a, a reliance on quotation and paraphrasing with very little summary, uh, which uh, Professor Howard and others argue summary is very important for being able to uh, do critical analysis, uh, critical thinking about a source, for setting up commentary and analysis of a source, and little sense of the nature of sources. Some of that's tied to the internet. That is, uh, it's harder for students to know that they're dealing with a, a reference uh, uh, source uh, from the internet, while while you know in the library they know when they're using a an encyclopedia, then they know what when they're using a reference uh, text rather than a uh, academic article or a uh, news article, um, and so we're seeing uh, they're seeing a lot of sources that uh, 20 years ago we wouldn't have uh, expected students to use. Um, and um, uh, so, anyway, um, uh, uh, one I want to uh, discuss is that uh, students, uh, let's writers, uh, use research in all kinds of genres, but they don't document in the, them in the same way that we do in academic articles and student papers. Um, there are different expectations about. Um, uh, that audiences have about uh, 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 how much documentation is necessary. There's kind of, uh, uh, there's different sense of patience about uh, with uh, looking at footnotes and uh, bibliographies and giving information about sources depending on uh, um, 
depending on the genre and, and the form where something is published. But that doesn't mean that because the reader isn't told what uh, um, uh, where information and, and opinions and ideas come from, uh, that writers aren't uh, expected to provide that information somewhere. Uh, there's a uh, there's a, a very uh, funny movie uh, on um, uh, Funny or Die, starring Bill Murray, called Fact Checkers Unit, and uh, it's about a pair of fact checkers <coughs> who are working for a magazine, and a writer comes in with her articles, and they have to go through all the facts that she claims in that, and uh, she has to provide the documentation for that. <clears throat> but they get down to one fact that is unsupported. Um, does Bill Murray drink milk just before going to sleep? And so the fact checkers end up uh, <clears throat> breaking into Bill Murray's house. Bill Murray finds them, decides, oh, let's just hang out for the day, watching TV and doing all kinds of, of, of of activities and then and then they wait till he is ready to go to bed and watch to see whether he has a drink of milk he does and so then they go back to the office and they have and they are able to say yes that fact is checked uh, that the article is ready to be published um, this is how facts and, and documentation work with a lot of popular uh, 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 magazines, newspapers, uh, editors will be going over it, fact checkers will be going over it, but there's a decision being made by the writer and others about what documentation readers need. Uh, for example, I'll give an, uh, uh, an example here uh, from uh, Newsweek, uh, Ezra Klein's uh, A Nativist Argument for Immigration, and he does not give you the source of this statistic. Uh, since 2001, we've gone from offering 195,000 highly skilled nieces to about 65,000 today. He doesn't uh, give the source about visas here. That's not unusual. Typically, uh, unless a st if a statistic isn't new, uh, <clears throat> if it's if uh, a government report uh, isn't a news story. Uh, the sources of a statistic usually aren't provided in um, uh, magazine articles and editorials or newspapers. Uh, I think the assumption I would make here is that this information is provided by some kind of government document, uh, maybe out of the State Department. Uh, but uh, that's something that, if I, if we were writing an academic article, we'd have to provide the, the, the source. That's something if a student is writing a uh, a paper, we would expect that student to provide the source of that statistic. That is almost something uh, you know students generally know that, uh, or at least uh, 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 realize that a statistic is something specific enough. You better provide that information. <clears throat> uh, I think when we're moving students as they're reading for um, popular genres of nonfiction as well as academic genres of, of nonfiction, <clears throat> we have to show students how the documentation works in a different way. And I would say, what, you know, one exercise you could take is, all right, what would you do to convert Ezra Klein's article into a student uh, uh, into something acceptable in a student paper? What would have to be done here? Uh, with parenthetical documentation uh, and a bibliography to make these claims legitimate claims uh, and, and uh, uh, for college paper um, and uh, as well as, as probably some kind of discussion about well why did Newsweek decide not to include that information for the reader it's almost certainly that they Newsweek has that information that Klein had to give his editor uh, and, his, and others at Newsweek sources. Uh, 
you might even bring up in something like this uh, or looking at perhaps a more controversial uh, 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 article where there are anonymous sources, <clears throat> that, that has become a, a big issue for journalists. Uh, what what uh, information about anonymous sources should be provided to readers if you're going to publish something based on an, an anonymous source, as well as what kind of documentation, what kind of, of backup do you need for an, an anonymous source? You know, is that person, uh, that source, enough to be able to state whether this, that, uh, uh, to publish this information? Or whether you, do you need something more than that? <clears throat> All right. Um, I would argue that uh, the teacher is not just the reader of a student paper, but also the fact checker. Uh, that's one of the reasons we require documentation, because uh, somebody needs, besides the student, besides the writer, needs to be able to check the sources and, fa and, and facts of the, of the paper. And with the in a classroom, that's going to be the teacher, unless unless you work out something else. You're going to be and checking <clears throat> how effective the uh, student is doing is paraphrasing, quoting, avoiding uh, uh, um, accidental plagiarism or patch writing, or uh, uh, working through that uh, process of learning how to uh, paraphrase and summarize if, uh, um, without. Uh, effectively, competently, is part of that. But, but, um, uh, I, uh, and I think that you know it makes sense to discuss. Uh, well, one of the things differences between an academic article and, a, say, a news article is that the readers, many of the readers of academic articles, are very interested in the research and the and the sources that the writer consulted. Um, Scholars uh, want to test that out. They're, they're going to be, uh, they won't necessarily accept what someone says just on the, on the, on, on the face of things. Uh, they may, and students may as well, may as well uh, want to know about the sources because they may want to look at those sources themselves if they're unfamiliar with them and, and make use of them in their own research. I mean, that's part of a, a standard uh, <coughs> way of teaching students to do research, check the bibliographies of books and articles that you're, that you're using that you think are good sources and take a look at some of what, what they're looking at for part of your research. That's not something that you normally find going on in a news article, uh, uh, although sometimes, you know, uh, 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 certainly not with all the uh, information provided in there. Um, we have hybrid works, like I would say Doris Kern, Goodwin's A Team of rival, Rivals, Mike Rose's The Mind at Work, <clears throat> that are both academic and popular in, uh, uh, and have really have two audiences. And so the, <clears throat> you don't find parenthetical documentation uh, at the end of sentences uh, or quotations. Uh, we don't find uh, footnote numbers. But there are notes at the back of the book uh, to identify each source of information for uh, 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 on each page for anything that's coming from research for that for uh, so that uh, it's uh, you have the tra traditional documentation, but it's handled in a different way because many of the readers of those works are, are, will find the academic documentation practices distracting. Um, <clears throat> But I think the differences between how academics handle documentation and how popular um, magazines, newspapers, and books handle documentation contributes to students' lack of awareness of how writers conduct research and use sources across a range of, of genres, academic genres, student genres, and popular genres. Uh, students often think that research is something that only goes into a research paper, or maybe you go to a source when you are, don't feel confident enough about 
analyzing a poem on your own. So you want to take take a look at what other uh, uh, how someone else has, has analyzed that and, and and use that in your own analysis. And and, you, and even with that, there's a sense if I was a stronger uh, critical reader, I I would need uh, 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 research really wouldn't be necessary in that. And I think it's because the way we part of that is the way we focus on documentation and student writing <clears throat> makes it harder for students to see research uh, that's go, uh, that is documented in other ways in other genres. And of course we're also dealing with the fact that students, uh, 18, 19 year old students, most of them haven't read a lot of nonfiction uh, on their own. Uh, so, uh, so and certainly not in critical ways. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it's useful then to do some analysis with students in the classroom of, diff of sources in um, uh, as writers use them. And I'm going to take a look at a couple here. This is um, from, uh, uh, from the, uh, the journal Young Scholars in Writing. Um, an undergraduate research journal uh, that publishes uh, articles, of pretty much all of which originated as research papers in college and university classes, including uh, in every issue uh, two or three uh, uh, research papers from uh, first year writing classes. And this one we're going to look at is Texting and Writing by Mike, Michael A. Collington who was a freshman at Marywood University in Pennsylvania uh, and is looking at the question of does texting uh, that students do affect their writing. Uh, <clears throat> I would say one thing you could start by doing a, an analysis of her use of sources is taking a look at her work cited. And what does that tell you about uh, her research and her um, uh, uh, and her process? Okay, and <clears throat> if you take a look here, there's actually a nice range of sources. Um, we have several news articles: Star Tribune, USA Today. Uh, I think there's something else in here. Uh, but uh, at least a couple of, 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 uh, of then news articles written for uh, uh, professors for, uh, and administrators in, in, uh, and teachers, uh, an article from Inside Higher Education and NEA Today. We have uh, works by linguists, David Crystal and Dennis Barron. And um, and then uh, 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 some research articles by uh, reading researchers doing empirical research in, in you know professors of, of uh, education. Uh, here something from Reading Research Quarterly and another from the New New England Reading Association Journal. Okay, you can also look. She's been um, careful to uh, have current sources. We see pretty much things that were published uh, 2007, uh, between 2007 and 2009. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing earlier than 2007. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's an impressive range of academic and scholarly research, uh, and, and academic and popular research. Um, empirical research as well as kind of uh, 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 opinion pieces or, or popular uh, uh, articles about that deal with uh, something that people are concerned about but perhaps uh, uh, and wondering about. Um, it's not just a bunch, you know, a, a mishmash of sources, I would say. I think it, there's, a, there's a plan uh, here. Um, on top of that, as she as she describes 
kind of methods, she did additional research. She interviewed two of her former teachers from high school. She interviewed seven students, uh, and she made a, uh, about their text speak and their writing. And she made the point of saying that uh, she, uh, uh, though that's not a lot of students, uh, she tried to get students who are very different from uh, each other and have a different opinions. And she examined student papers uh, to, and to look for evidence of text speak uh, in their writing. So uh, 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 this isn't just an argument from, a, by, from authority. It's not an, a, a research paper that is basically trying to decide which expert is, is right. Uh, her first two sections really set up the issue as, an, uh, as a debate. Concerns about text speak um, deals with the uh, uh, opinions of how text speak hurts writing, and then responses uh, to concerns about spec text speak are uh, claims that text speak either has no effect on writing, but uh, or actually has a good effect on writing. Um, on student writing. Uh, she makes a lot of use of informing students within the text about her sources. I think here she's using a, a uh, an article from USA Today 2008, but it's interesting that she doesn't make this about the journalist who wrote the article but about the source that the journalists use, the statistic coming from the National Center for Education Statistics. That the article quotes Jackie Ramey, I'm sorry, Jackie Ream, a former teacher and author of KISS, Keep It Short and Simple. Okay. She does that throughout the essay, either giving information about the author of her source or giving information about the sources that uh, um, that journalists used in their news articles. Naomi Barron, a linguist of professor of American University, a Minnesota teacher of, of, of ninth, seventh and ninth graders, uh, an English teacher, uh, probably a high school English teacher, I think. Um, as a result, uh, you know, uh, uh, we get a sense of this being a debate or an argument going on um, primarily among teachers, uh, middle school, high school, and universities, uh, rather than among journalists and, and uh, uh, the media. Uh, that's in there, but it's, it's mainly an argument that teachers are having, as well as some scholars that looking at language and technology. Um, and as she gets into the, uh, her own research, she makes a move away from a, dis discuss a, a discussion of, or uh, explanation of the argument into research that's more and more empirical. She's moving less away from the experts into actually looking at, at, at uh, what students are doing. So she's doing that not only in her, her own uh, study, which is, uh, focuses on, on a particular question, does text speak in some, ha some way affect the spelling and punctuation and grammar and uh, uh, use of acronyms in, in student papers. Uh, she, you know, she's looking at that rather than some of the concerns about, well, does it make, uh, 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 the, about text, uh, texting giving students more practice with writing and that being good, more confidence about writing, uh, more audience awareness, uh, those things she decides not to really deal with. But, uh, so she uh, discusses her own findings, but she's also looking for, at sources that are looking at 
the same, uh, similar kinds of research. Dennis Barron's book, A Better Pencil, uh, uh, Readers, Writers, and Digital Revolution. She, at this point, she's not interested. She's less interested in his opinion than in what he says he sees students doing in their writing, and in the, in his survey of what they're doing. Here he's saying that that college students find text speak uh, immature and childish, and they 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 uh, stop doing it by even in high school. Um, we have. Um, Uh, the Shaw Carlson and Waxman article she brings in to um, say, you know, a, a study of 86 students taking an introduction to education course and finding they were, found very little evidence of, te of text speak in their writing. So she, uh, 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 there's also, she's also looking at um, the t t teacher interviews to kind of, because the teachers at this point are closer are observing student writing themselves, although that is more anecdotal and she, and she puts less weight in that. She ends up finally using herself as a support, uh, as a source. Um, uh, how she writes in text, she says she sends and receives about 6,400 texts a month, but she never uses text speak in her own writing. Um, if you look at the, uh, it's not a conclusive study, but she's done a good job of challenging uh, 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 those who's, who argue that text speak is uh, uh, damaging student writing in, in this uh, paper. And, and, and uh, I think it, it encourages students to, uh, who might read this to look into this themselves, to take a look at their own writing, their classmates' writing, their friends' writing, to see as well as that, you know, uh, it, are the findings that she's finding with the paper she's looking at and these other sources um, true in their papers, it, it, with, with other papers if you look at that, because uh, especially considering that how widely held the idea is that uh, uh, text speak is hurting student writing. Um, uh, I think um, if we we'll move on to the, uh, one more piece, uh, it's, I think it's good to see how, uh, to note how she is using paraphrase quotation and um, summary. So here with Reem, you see that she starts with a quotation, then moves into I would say here. A, a summary rather than a paraphrase. It's really a, a, a couple sentences that um, get beyond uh, 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 what might be said in an individual sentence. Quotation uh, here for uh, because it's it's a it's a an interesting quotation, uh, but most of it she is putting in her own words. So she get us uh, here. She uses just the word parrot. From uh, from Reem, and the rest is put in her own words. You, you can see here she seems to have a pretty firm grasp on what Reem is saying. She's a, a, her uh, uh, Cullington's voice is coming through, and she's deploying quotations that um, with, that are, are uh, with with interesting uh, language and uh, he, here with parrot. Uh, uh, a, uh, she's choosing that, I, I would say, for the negative con uh, a connotation uh, to really get the, the critical part of, of this out. And this is something she does throughout. She, uh, she does not overquote. She uh, also steps back and can uh, say in one sentence what might have taken a page for this, uh, for, or, or longer for the paper, for someone, uh, for the writer to discuss the the paper, and as a result, she's able to step back and and, and um, look at the debate, at the argument uh, as a whole, and the, and the back and forth as a whole. When we look at something in the popular media, I like to look. I actually like to have to have students look at uh, arguments and reports about plagiarism. <clears throat> but this issue, 
I can get into um, discussions about why plagiarism is such a big deal, why, why, it's, why uh, uh, teachers punish plagiarism, even as we kind of say, well, it's, you know, um, uh, even as we kind of discuss well, what it is and, look, and discuss the use of sources and, and, uh, uh, effectively as well as the plagiarist plagiarist work. So O'Rourke's argument here is really about, uh, which appeared in, which is in Slate magazine, is an argument that plagiarism is wrong, uh, we think, more because the writer has a, uh, is avoiding work uh, uh, instead of doing the work of rewriting and rethinking uh, what someone has written, they just uh, put that sentence or passage into, into it without doing the work of paraphrasing. Uh, and, maybe, and, and maybe some of the other work that would really go into it. So it's a, a uh, so she's arguing that we dislike, we condemn plagiarism, plagiarists because they're slackers more than because they have been unoriginal. Okay. But uh, her argument uses sources, uh, uh, kind of like Cullington does, to look at the two sides of the, uh, uh, the two sides of this issue, right? Uh, so one of her main sources is Robert Crumb's book, uh, little book of plagiarism, and he is making the argument, right, we prize originality above everything and place a high value on novelty of expression <clears throat> that uh, our, uh, we care about plagiarism because of our cult of originality that's shaped by the romantics, and as opposed to that, she uses Thomas Mallon's book, Stolen Words Forays into the Origins and Ravages of Plagiarism, uh, which really regards uh, plagiarism as, as theft, as taking some, uh, and really theft of somebody else's work, somebody else's effort. Um, and really, uh, the, that's the uh, one here where she's talking about uh, student plagiarism, right? Because uh, she's mainly concerned about the plagiarism of professional writers. Uh, so here he said, yeah, this is, we're not really worried that, about plagiarism because a C student has tried to pass himself off as Matthew Arnold. It's an academic crime because the student who buys his thesis from a paper mill has shirked the labor that his fellow students actually perform. I, uh, this is one of the reasons I like to do this, to, to have students read ar articles about plagiarism so we can get into what's, what's really unethical about it as we actually discuss some of the uh, uh, mechanics of deploy, deploying sources. Um, uh, with this article, I, I like to point out Oops. Even with fact checkers, we don't catch everything. Uh, uh, O'Rourke had to make a, a correction after the, she originally published this uh, <clears throat> because she identified a, uh, 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 the source of Martin Scorsese's film, The Departed, as a Taiwanese film and had to change that to identify uh, uh, infernal affairs as a Hong Kong film. Uh, there's an interesting use of an unusual source here where she cites a movie about the long distance runner Steve, Pro Steve Prefontaine uh, where uh, Prefontaine says, at least his character says, talent is a myth. He's, she uses, she uh, uh, as opposed, as opposed to hard work, that's what makes a an artist an artist. Uh, 
genius it may be, it, uh, and originality may be part of it, but uh, hard work is, uh, uh, is the main part of it. And, and getting back to the idea that uh, the plagiarist is passing off uh, the work of somebody else as their, as their own and avoiding that hard work. Uh, and, uh, and it's not a problem of, of originality. Um, to wrap this up, we, you know, not everything is, um, most of the time, uh, 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 a work identifies a source, but not always. Uh, here, <clears throat> she doesn't give you the news stories that um, uh, that discussed Dan Brown and Yann Martell and Doris Kearns Goodwin, Stephen Ambrose, the plagiarism charges and cases against them, although I think you might expect that um, uh, uh, anyone could Google that to find out. Uh, because this is online, um, the use of hypertext allows uh, more documentation that you, than, you would than you found in that uh, Newsweek article. Um, you can go right to the sources from here. When this is reproduced in my textbook, of course, we lose that. Uh, so there's a certain amount of, of documentation online that you might not find in print because of that. But at the same time, it's, it's only there if, for readers who really want to find it. Uh, uh, so again, that, that's a, a, something that distinguishes documentation in popular uh, genres as opposed to academic genres. So uh, again, I would have students take a look at this and say, all right, how would we need to document this for a class or for an academic journal like Young Scholars in Writing? Um, what would we need to do uh, uh, that our work isn't doing? Uh, so you bring, so students see the research and uh, and understand the differences between documentation practices. Okay, I guess I'm ready to take questions. Okay, Jim, here's our first question. It's from Karen Bain at Tiffin University, and she is wondering um, how can we help students distinguish between reliable uh, internet or online sources and those that probably shouldn't be used um, in a college paper. She observes that um, you know a lot of students assume if it's on the net it must be good, and, but there's also kind of this side problem in that um, some older sources, um, for example, um, literary criticism, um, won't appear on on the net, so they fly totally under the student's radar. So maybe um, some strategies for getting students to um, to look at the, the credibility, reliability question, um, but also to recognize that the net isn't the be-all and end-all that they sometimes uh, might think it to be. Okay. Um, well, you know, I, I think that the traditional uh, uh, way of, of evaluating sources, at least at the beginning, right, is uh, uh, has value here. Is That is, what are the credentials of the author? Uh, is this person a uh, an expert or not? Uh, uh, why would we trust this person? I think that it also extends to the credibility of the uh, the form, the website, uh, because that's often uh, uh, a newspaper writer, right? Uh, uh, it may not be well known, uh, particularly someone early in his or her career. Uh, but the credibility uh, uh, and uh, that the we give to that that article comes from well the the, the newspaper itself and, and the, the mm -hmm. publishers and editors behind it, and you certainly will look at date and, and particularly looking at uh, the date is um, tricky depending on the um, on the subject right and as you mentioned some some older sources. Uh, are perfectly useful in something like history or um, literature, but 
probably not that, that good on, on uh, uh, but something on technology can get updated very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think it makes sense for students to ask questions, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about this? Uh, um, that they're going to have to learn it from uh, uh, hearing how other people evaluate this, these sources. One of the problems that students that I think students have on with uh, web sources <clears throat> is that something like uh, um, WebMD is basically a reference book. And that's not, and, you know, it's basically equivalent to a, uh, an encyclopedia. Uh, and it can be perfectly legitimate for certain kinds of things, but we don't like students to be using an encyclopedia article as a central source. It may be okay for an isolated fact or definition. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, I'm not sure, but I think it takes a little bit of savvy uh, for students to be, uh, be able to pick out a reference source on the Internet from an, an article on the Internet. So I think you have to have uh, bring these into discussions. And I, and I would say it probably is better to ha have um, class discussions or small group discussions so that uh, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. I take a look at your uh, uh, at your sources and we, when we talk about them. I think we, if we want to pass this uh, these our critical abilities along, then we um, then then students should be able to kind of eavesdrop on discussions about uh, their classmate sources as well. So I, mm -hmm. uh, I, mm -hmm. I I don't think it's an easy answer. I think we develop our ability to evaluate sources over time and, and with practice and sometimes by making mistakes and and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think it's just got to be brought into our discussions of, of sources. Mm -hmm. Thanks Jim. I have one more question. I think we have time for, for this one. This is from um, Elizabeth Kessler at the University of Houston. Um, she's writing that in looking at te the article texting and writing, I see that the author did not use parenthetical documentation after direct quotations in the first paragraph in the section mm -hmm. um, concerns about text speak. So how do you feel about that? Do you see that as a, um, a technical lack, even though the author introduces the article that she's using immediately in the paragraph? Or how, you know, more pertinently, how would you explain to students? Oh, um, that I think... Okay, I think the reason there's no parenthetical documentation, let me take a look, is yes, that she took this off the web. Uh, so, mm -hmm. I don't, so I think there's no parenthetical, there's no page number there because she did not have a page number. Uh, it wasn't provided because mm -hmm. it was taken from USA Today um, on the web rather than, uh, rather than the print version of USA Today. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, you know, I, I, that, it's a good point. Uh, um, uh, I think this, I th think that the stu student has done this correctly, mm -hmm. but, um, but I think, yeah, that it calls for some discussion. Yeah, not, not everything we find on the web is going to have page numbers to that and, and so what does that do with our uh, our uh, practices for that and um, and, I, and um, I, I at least have that, that that needs to be discussed well, I'm struck by how much um, you know in, in looking at this and um, and the way you're walking us through it it these kind of activities provide so many um, great teaching moments don't they for um, for really contextualizing these um, and even problematizing questions of, um, of our practice around um, citations documentation and, and how it um, you know how it kind of evolves so. yes and uh, you know and I think it, you know I like to sometimes just do a, a have students do source analysis in small groups or class discussion and, and other times you know when we're analyzing an article, Source analysis will just be part of, of uh, 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 a regular analysis of that. Well, why did this person use this source? Mm -hmm. How did they use it? But I, I think something like um, our teaching of, of how to summarize and how to set up commentary mm -hmm. um, about a source, 
that I think I, you know students need to see how writers are doing that and doing that effectively, um, mm -hmm. and uh, in order to begin to figure out how to do that themselves. Well, I think those are those are great points. Thank you so much for your time this morning, uh, Jim. And uh, you're welcome to to hang around. And so is everyone else for our next session, which is going to be starting up in about 10 minutes, um, with Drs. Charles Payne and Richard Johnson Sheehan. They'll be talking about uh, power over, power with strategies for teaching conversation argument. So I hope uh, to see you all there.